in to tips and tricks to be aware of when deploying your own spell widget slash library. Um, I was uh, trying to decide on which way to approach this presentation and I chose to do it a little bit on a, on a way that you can see and appreciate maybe the benefits that having certain components outside of the Drupal ecosystem can have for you. So, um, if you're not familiar with Svelte, I will be talking a little bit about Svelte and some of its benefits. I'll be covering a little bit about Beat and some of what Beat gives you out of the box. Because Svelte by itself, unless you're using Svelte Kit, uses Rolla, which is another bundler, which if you're not familiar with either, is kind of like Webpack, but it's not. It's kind of like newer and it works a little better. So make it once, deploy it everywhere. So what do we get out of using a widget? We get a code to go that is flexible, multi-purpose, and feature rich. Um, why did I go with a belt approach? That's kind of where the case study side of things come in. At the university, we have multiple stakeholders. Some of them would like to be able to, and I guess it's a little bit of the storytelling part, would like to be able to go to a page, whether that leaves on our CRM, CMS, and our CRM sometimes is not Salesforce, but it's kind of like Salesforce. And there's a couple of other systems in the university that alumni services and a couple of other people use. They want to be able to use what the editorial team publishes on the newsroom and be able to bring those in, and then just have a highlight of those stories. Highlighting those stories can be important important uh, to kind of improve the feedback that you get from alumni and other people and that's kind of why I went this route because I could have made it and I'm gonna cover a little bit about that with a few alternatives uh, whether that was a Drupal module or a WordPress plugin or just a JavaScript single page app but then it wouldn't be embeddable and you wouldn't have the benefits that you get from like Google Maps or other APIs. So here's an example of the why. Uh, and this is something I implemented at a university early on when I got there and we were migrating to Drupal. They, um, academic affairs, use a product called Digital Measures. It just so happens that Digital Measures uh, is basically for accreditation and it lets faculty have a page that they can centrally manage and allows them to put all the faculty research and other things in that page. Um, but what you get out of digital measures is you can either have the script or you could try to, back in the day, go to drupal.org and use the model. But it just so happens that this company was paying a third party um, consultant to do the Drupal module. And he was tired of supporting that. And they are not a Drupal company. They are mostly a third-party service. So what they decided to do is give us a widget, a script, similar to what I did, uh, to embed on the page. Now, this one right here, I did it through a content type, and then through Twig, I was able to automate some of that process so you wouldn't have to go through each page, because of course, that's a little dangerous. It really depends on your site editors. But it can have um, some repercussions. So Watermark is the name of the company that is now the pattern of digital measures. And that's something that I was looking into just to kind of have a little bit of an example of why would you want to go to this approach. And this is more prevalent nowadays on um, different systems. But every other vendor that we dealt with, whether it was this or Gecko, which is a chatbot, will give you an embed. And yes, you could use Google Tag Manager, but in some cases you don't want to because you want to be, be able to have the flexibility that Drupal provides to have different URLs and other things and different paths. So how? Uh, so what happens, uh, here's a scenario for you to think about. What happens if you just want to add content into a page with straight JavaScript? And also, well, yeah, well, I will start with that. What happens? If you go to the Mozilla docs, 
you have to actually create the div element by itself and then you have to create the text of the node and then you have to append it. Now you can imagine that that is not complicated to do if you were only adding one div that doesn't really have a lot of uh, content inside of it. But if you are going down at three and then you're trying to do a full component, whether that's a card or something else, now it gets complicated because you will have to use a for loop or something like it. Um, this script right here is an example of what I was telling you about that these companies will give you. You will go to their page, very similar to what Google Maps will give you as well, and then you will copy it. Usually it will bring, and this is from their documentation, so it's not like I'm exposing or widget ID. Um, you will copy that, which I guess attached to the window. It has a window uh, widget ID. It has a script that it points to, and then sometimes you give it a div uh, ID or class name that it will roll on. But um, I, I saw that and I thought, well, this could potentially solve the issues that we have at the university. It will give us the flexibility to be able to use our API endpoints, whether that was WordPress or Drupal, to capture the data and bring it in. Now, what happens next is you go, when you're trying to develop a widget or um, well, when you're trying to develop a widget, you will go most likely to look at that script and try to maybe reverse engineer how they did it, or that library. And if you do that, you're going to run into some of this. Now, that um, is hard to read because it's minimized. And on top of that, it was probably, they probably used some sort of export from either Svelte or something else to compile all the assets and to make it so it's a standalone script. That can have its challenges because it makes you think, oh, maybe I chose the hard approach because, you know, that's not native JavaScript. That looks a little sad, you know, a little sad puppy face right there. You know, like, ah, oh, I'm going to have to do something else. But I should move on and give you a demo. And let me switch to the demo so you guys can see kind of what the widget that I work on does. Mm -hmm. And then this demo is using Drupal 10.1. And I know you're going to see me pasting the stuff in full HTML, and that's mostly for demonstration purposes. I'm not endorsing people doing that. But I do know that's how uh, uh, content editors might do it, because it's an easy way. And if they have access to it, they probably go through this approach. So this is just a standard tender one install. And then I'm just gonna add the script as full HTML. And interesting enough, um, and this is actually, and uh, it's on my slides as well, a little bit about uh, something of what I'm gonna cover because when you're doing a library or a widget, you have to bust the cache differently because you want to account for backwards compatibility and you also want to account for um, basically loaning the latest version of your application. And I have a couple of examples there that I will cover. If you don't make it backwards compatible, what you, what's going to happen is that the page that you loaded that script onto is going to load but you might have some challenges later. So this, I just pasted the script, the script went and I talked to a Laravel proxy that I have just in case you know anybody was wondering, it's just proxying that to WordPress. And the reason why I added the proxy is because I didn't want a WSOD, a white screen of that, that page. And WordPress lets you request 50 elements from the news stories. Um, so the web API that enters the UTC.edu is a Laravel proxy, but you could use um, Postman or Hopscotch and a couple of other alternatives just to kind of look at that information. Now here I change the parameters, but I made a typo, which is one of the challenges when they give you this type of script. And the typo I made was that I didn't add the add sign and you will see it in just a second. And I thought about taking it out because I had time to record this and why not? But then I thought, well, you know, it's important to know that that's one of the challenges you get when you create a widget. You give it to people and you hope for the best. But it is kind of like for ambitious um, side builders and why not? Because they could make a mistake. 
and have some challenges. Now, that is using Tailwind and it's using a couple of other things. It looked very squished uh, at the beginning and that was only because at the university we didn't really have that specific ratio, so I didn't have to worry about that. But because it was on Tailwind and because Twig is based out on uh, Jinja and a bunch of other stuff, as Belt also uses a similar syntax to Twig, so you can just transfer your component. And if, because we were using Tailwind CSS, I only had to add my colors, add some of my variables, and everything will come in. And then that will give you a link to the storage. And you could have it with images or without images. Uh, something that our content team at the university does well is tagging the stories by categories. And those categories, in the latest version of WordPress, have an ID. If you change where it says 751, to something else and you know what the ID is, you could load just the new stories for that category. So you could make it so people from academic affairs can only have the new stories that they care or not. And then you can also turn off uh, the image if you wanted to and then just have some of the text. There are a few challenges with um, widgets and that is that there could be a delay in the connection because it's being rendered in the client so I wouldn't advise putting them above the fold. So when the page loads, you probably want to put it in the middle of the page or towards the bottom so they will load. But also, I know a colleague of mine suggested that I added a spinner. Because having a spinner and also having like a div, a placeholder div, will make it so your widget doesn't shift your content as much and it makes it a little more accessible. You may not see the spinner if it loads fast, but if it doesn't, the spinner is there and then just kind of gives you a visual representation that there's something loading onto the page. Let me see. And that's that. Let me go back to the slides. So there, here's a, a link to the gist that kind of like just lets you copy. Uh, basically, that gives you that embed. And if you were to paste it on any type of site, it will work as you saw in that example. It would just query the information. Um, there is no concern on that overloading our service because the proxy API is doing uh, file caching. So it caches the file the first time it gets hit. And then it puts it into a caching storage, which gets wiped every other hour. So that kind of prevents our servers from being overwhelmed if for some reason we kind of had a DDoS attack or anything of that nature. And then I also added a link to that GitHub repo that covers, and I will show you a little bit about that to emphasize a little bit of what that looks like and how that um, project is set up. So what are your alternatives? You can create a widget but you don't have to. You could also make a Drupal custom module. Um, if you do make it as a custom module, you can use Gossel to import information, or you could use the Migrate API or something else and have it inside of your Drupal instance. That will let you parse the text, but that has the challenge that now you are bundled to Drupal and you couldn't really move it into a static site builder or any other system. If you make it as a WordPress plugin, you can use, and I've done that before, because for a different project, I did a widget in WordPress that lets you reuse footers, because sometimes at a university, people want to have a similar footer with the numbers, with the address, and other items. And uh, you could, you know, probably look into um, potentially a uh, uh, a set of other things that you will want to embed it in. Some of them are 11TY, Salesforce, Modic, which used to be owned by Acquia, uh, which is more of like a marketing campaign system, and other things. So what are the trade-offs? If you make a widget, uh, you'll likely need a spinner, because 
For the most part, it will load fast enough, but if you are loading images, if you want the images to come in with a high res, it might take a second or a microsecond, but it might be perceivable for the end user. Um, a trade-off that you also get out of this is uh, most widgets are not developed to have more than one widget per page. And you can see that with like Google Maps in some cases, and you can see it with other things like chatbots. Like the chatbot doesn't let you add another one because it gets attached to the first uh, class or ID that it's looking for, and then that's what you get. Which can be nice because it could uh, prevent users from creating too many uh, IDs and kind of a, kind of like WSOD, a wide screen of that their side just by having them load all in the same page. And then it might not be as editorial friendly as a Drupal module, but there's good news. You can always make it a wrapper. And that's something that I started taking a look at. Because uh, you could use the library, the JavaScript library, to source the data, and that way you wouldn't have that extra content living inside of like Drupal or WordPress. But you could provide the editors an experience that will allow them to avoid easy mistakes, like the ad sign that I was showing you earlier. So, what about Velt? And uh, what about Beat? What are some of the benefits that you get out of those? Um, I know it really depends on what the crowd is and who is listening to this video, but if you are a back-end developer, uh, Spelt can be, um, I would say it's a good replacement to potentially jQuery, because it gives you a lot of that same flexibility, it lets you parse the elements on the page, and the best part is it doesn't require you to add an extra library, because Spelt, once you use it and once it's built up, it gets compiled into a JavaScript file that's a little hard to read just because it's minimized, but it's very lightweight. And then if you were to upgrade, like you can do with React or Angular or Vue, you won't have to go and change it unless there was like a security need or you really wanted to. So it takes that concern away. Also, this belt does not use the virtual DOM. Um, and that's something that Rick Harris had uh, talked about and the virtual DOM just makes it so in some cases with React and Vue you have to like refresh multiple components to reach the bottom one kind of like the problem that people have with paragraphs and paragraph provisions but in the front end because if you have a nested item and the button is all the way inside of that sometimes you have to let everything know and I think React is kind of addressing that concern nowadays but I don't know if they fully gotten away with that. Here's an example that you will see in the wild. If you ever had to use Google Maps, that's kind of an example of a widget uh, that you can drop everywhere, basically. You just have, need a key, and then you just put the key somewhere, and, and it loads in the page. And then you might need to use pins, but you might not. Um, so what, is the, uh, what are the parts that are involved in this application? So. Something that is important to know if you ever create a widget, you want to use a CDN and you want to use a CDN for a library. Because a mistake I made is initially I thought, you know what, I'm just going to push it to Netlify because it's going to be public or Cloud for Pages and I'm going to try to grab the CSS and I'm going to try to grab the JS and then just point to that. But if you do that, you have a couple of challenges, one of which is um, if you make the mistake of compiling your spell application or anything else as an app and not a library, it will prepend and add right here, and Drupal does this, so you've probably seen it, a cache busting string. It might be before the JS, it might be after the JS, and that's just so the browser knows that it needs to de destroy the cache on the client and then it loads the latest version. If you are doing it for a library, you don't want to do that, because if you do it for the library and it's embedded into multiple pages, you now made some of those pages break potentially because now there is, I mean, uh, a lot of these websites use relative URLs for the latest current version and for uh, a revision they use a slightly different URL and now they always won't load and if you had it deployed in 50 pages, uh, that will be a lot of work for you to check and potentially make sure they work. So you want to keep this name consistent. But then you may ask, how do I bust the cache if I push a new version of this JavaScript file uh, without breaking it? The way you do it, uh, or at least the way that I found, 
that is fairly simple to do it is to follow the standard that React, Alpine.js, and a couple of the other libraries have done, and then use a release, and then the release is what actually busts the cache. So now you can be pinned to one release for that one library, and you don't have to worry about it. And if you want to make it a little faster, you can go to JS Deliver, and then you tell it the URL in GitHub that has the JS file that you want to make publicly available, and it will cache that. It will even cache a um, JavaScript file. So that makes it so now your thing is cached on a CDN, and you don't have to worry about um, you know GitHub being overwhelmed or if, if you know. If GitHub, if you were to point it to the GitHub, it might work, but if you have a spike in traffic, I'm sure GitHub will probably uh, close it down and then you might have an issue. So Svelte lets you define an ID, and this is the ID that gets loaded. Uh, this is the point in the page where the application will get loaded once it gets rendered. How do you give variables to your Svelte app? That's something that took me a little bit because once you are inside of JavaScript, you can do it a couple of different ways. One way to do it is to attach it to the window. I don't know that that's necessarily the standard, and I know in some cases it's not convenient, but for a widget, that's what traditionally people do. They just define a variable, and then inside of the variable, you can add what the URL and the image is. And inside of this belt app, now you can read that information, parse it, and do anything else that you need. Let's go to the next one. Um, so, what are some tips um, to keep in mind when doing this? Be careful with uh, nesting caching la layers, because uh, now that you are doing that, um, you may, if you if you did a wrapper in Drupal to just kind of like provide users with an easy interface for your library of widgets, you kind of have to increase uh, the version of that uh, library in Drupal. And there is, let me share my screen here, because there is um, a nice article about that. Whoops. Oh, this one right here. Um, so when you're creating a module in Drupal, you want to give it a version 2 because this is kind of what it does the busting. But you, you could update to a newer version of the library or widget that we're creating. But if you just want to update the version for that particular module, then you can do it within. And you know, the version key is not something that people use a lot. I don't think once they deploy their module, whether that's custom or whether that's custom, because probably contrib does. Uh, but if you are making changes and you're doing a major one, you can make sure that the application itself gets busted right there. So let me switch to this. Uh, so this is the script that I loaded over there, and I'm glad this screen is kind of looking a little cleaner. The reason why you might be asking yourself, well, why do you have CSS right here? This is for the spinner. Because in some cases, if for some reason the CDN was having an issue loading the style sheet and loading the yes, I still want to give users something so they can either decide to remove it or be warned that there's that's not loading. And so the spinner is just outside. Uh, and this is basically the whole code that creates the spinner. And it also creates the container because you want to have a little container so you could see it on the page. If you didn't have these two, what will happen is if there was an issue serving this, it might go into a console error, but it will be hard to perceive visually. So you might just have that added into your body field or something else and have to deal with it later at some point. Um, let me see. I have another thing here that I was going to cover. So the project. But I'm going to cover that one with VS Code just to show you kind of how that would look like. Oops.
the BS code window doesn't want to go to the other side. Let's see if there is something here. That's interesting. Well, I can show it also from within with this screen. Um, some of this stuff is just boilerplate, like you have in Drupal, so you don't really have to worry about it. The only things that I changed was a little bit of the Delwin configuration, um, just to point it to the right folder, and then um, you go into the source, and then Svelte has the app.svelte file, and then from within the app.svelte file, you can define components if you want to. But for an app that is simple as this one, you don't really have to. So I thought, well, let me show it in a way that is simple and more approachable. The first thing I do in here is just kind of like query the stuff. And, and I use a put request just because that puts it into the Laravel proxy. And that makes that file being cached. So it, is, it streamlines the process and it makes it a little faster. And then down here is the component that I actually copied over from what we had in Drupal and then just changed some of the syntax to match um, what um, Isabella was looking for and then just parse the different elements. And just by parsing some of those different elements inside of that API, you can just get the title, you can get the image, um, and then just print them onto the page. Now that's one element that is important, and the other one is the main.js, um, which just tell it which element in the page you want it to attach to, and that's it. Now if you go back, the this folder is the one that contains the code that uh, the CDN is grabbing, and this one right here um, is kind of like the spell compile version of, uh, of that code. As you can see, it's a little more complicated. Very similar to what I was showing you first. You never really have to touch this file again, unless for some reason it stops working, but at that point, you probably could compile it again. And that's kind of one of the benefits that it has and it does for you. And then it also has like the styles, you know, whatnot, and everything is compiled and minimized. So let me switch back. Be careful with your images. Cache your API content, because initially I was just getting the information out of um, uh, WordPress, but if you get it out of WordPress, depending on what you are querying, it might take a second, because WordPress has to do a join for all those tables, and it makes it a little more convoluted. Write wrappers. I would totally recommend that you write a wrapper for some of the elements, because uh, it makes it easier for the editors. Like This script works nicely, and it does what it needs to do, but it, not, it, might not not, it might not be the thing that you want to have a um, new editor start on because they might make quite a few mistakes. And rightfully so because, you know, it requires you to copy code. Um, and then be careful with the white screen of that because you could request too much and then get the main thread of the browser busy and then just kind of have an issue. And then I put my slide towards the end. So that's me. My name is Bernardo. I work as a front-end developer for both this. Uh, there's my Drupal.org, the Twitter, and the LinkedIn. Feel free to uh, connect with me, and why not? Um, and I'm a certified Drupal 9 and Drupal 10 developer. So I try to, uh, I, I encourage people to take the test because they are nice, and they kind of give you a lot of inside knowledge into what's coming, and you know, kind of how to make your approach to Drupal a little better. They are cool things to have. And I work for Baltis. Uh, one more thing before uh, that I wanted to show, and let me see if I can share it on this screen. Oh, I have to go to this one. Mm -hmm. There we go. I need dark, which maybe it's not that great, but um, I'm using Hopscotch to just kind of show you the web API endpoint that I was parsing over there. 
And I made it a put request because that actually puts a file into the Laravel proxy API. But once you request it, you get all this information back and you're welcome to parse as many. I mean, I now have it on 12, but I could have it on just one element. And then, yeah, this is kind of like the information that I'm parsing and I'm giving the users back. So there's even fields in here that I didn't really use, but they could be used and the library could be extended to have a 2.0 version or to have a 3.0 version and then make use of more stuff. And this is also a nice alternative to, um, um, what is the name of the thing? Um, hmm. It's not Podman, but it's just Postman. Postman, yeah. This is the open source version of Postman. So I know you were talking about different open source projects. Yes. Yeah, that's a nice What's one. What's that one called? Yeah. This one is Hopscotch. Hopscotch? Yep. Hopscotch. So it looks like Postman. It does look like Postman and it behaves like it, but they have a GitHub repo and they have everything on there. Any questions? That kind of covers a little bit of the basics on why you want to make a widget. What are the benefits of having a widget? What are some of the challenges of having a widget? Could you make it with something else if you wanted, with React or something? Yes, you could. I mean, for the purposes that I'm using, all of them will do it, except for now you added another dependency, and this way you don't have to worry about it. Go ahead. Oh, cool. Thank you.